Well, who is Jesus to you? Is he someone who is uh, close? Someone who is a friend? Or is he someone who is distant? When you think of Jesus, do you think primarily of his humanity? Or do you think of his divinity? Of how he is like God? How, How do you think of Jesus? Who is Jesus to you? There has been a a bit of a trend in recent times to emphasise Jesus' humanity uh, in churches, in theology, to particularly talk about how he experienced so many of the ordinary human experiences, about his family life as he grew up, about his experience of tiredness, for example, and of emotions, the sorts of things that he went through from day to day as he began his ministry and as it drew towards its, uh, its inevitable and terrible end. Even the miracles that we have seen in Luke's gospel can, in a sense, be seen as helping to point to his true humanity, uh, having an authority that humans should have, uh, as we're made, but obviously don't have. Now, I think in in many ways this is a good thing that there's an emphasis on Jesus' real humanity. Understanding him better helps us to see what he was doing and to help us to see what he achieved. It helps us to understand that he was fully human. But, of course, we also need to be able to see the other side. We need to be able to see Jesus' divinity as well. And so it's important important for us to step back from time to time and see the, the... other truly amazing thing that the scripture writers say about Jesus, that he was more than just a man. That in Jesus, God was in reality coming into our world. In the person of Jesus, we see God the Son, God taking on flesh in his very person. Now, most of the way through the Gospels, as we've been seeing, there is an emphasis on Jesus' humanity. And as we've been working our way through Luke, I think that we've seen that. But we've also seen that Jesus has been doing some pretty amazing things. And so it's raised the question, who is he? But that question hasn't really been asked directly in Luke's Gospel. But in the passage that we're looking at today, uh, from Luke chapter 8, we see that the question's asked and in a fairly short time answered in the way that Luke does these things. So it'd be great if you uh, have your Bible there open at Luke chapter 8, and we're looking at uh, verse the section that begins at verse 22. And what we see in two incidents, uh, centred and based around the Sea of Galilee, or the lake as it's uh, sometimes called, that this question of who is Jesus is really brought to the fore. And then as they come to the other side of the lake, there's there's an answer given. So let's look at the first incident uh, as Jesus and his disciples are crossing the Sea of Galilee in a boat. And we're told that uh, Jesus said, let's go to the other side of the lake. So they got in the boat and set out and as they sailed, he fell asleep. Now we don't know exactly what had been happening just before, but we can assume that Jesus had been busy in the ministry that he had been doing and that we've seen all the way uh, through this early part of Luke's gospel. Teaching about the kingdom of God, healing people, helping people in all sorts of ways, talking about the forgiveness of sins that God offers. No doubt he was dead tired, which is why he fell asleep in the back of the boat as the uh, disciples are sailing or rowing across the lake, being experienced fishermen, This would have been something that some of them at least were experienced fishermen and this would have been something that they would have just been uh, reasonably routine for them to do. Except that what we see was on this day, something happened which made even those experienced fishermen afraid. Because a squall, a storm came down on the lake so the boat was being swamped and they were in great danger. Now as I said, These were experienced fishermen. And so it wouldn't have been an ordinary gentle breeze that made them think that they were in great danger. 
So much so that they went to Jesus, verse 24, and said, Master, Master, we're going to drown. Quite a squall, quite, quite a storm. If their boat was being swamped and they were that afraid of drowning. Perhaps they wanted Jesus to help with the bailing. Perhaps they wanted him to, to move so that they could help to steady the boat. Or perhaps they were hoping that he might do something else, miraculous to, to help the boat stay afloat. What Jesus did, though, shocked them all, as we see there in verse 24, because he got up and rebuked the wind and the raging waters, and the storm subsided, and all was calm. Now, we know that storms can come and go fairly quickly, but this was something else. They're in the middle of a storm, and they're afraid that they're going to sink, and when Jesus stands up and rebukes, speaks to the wind, speaks to the waves, and it seems immediately they calm down. This is not just a prayer that they might be spared and the wind gradually died away or they got through it. I don't know if you've ever been out in a boat and you suddenly find yourself in a scary situation. The waves are a fair bit bigger perhaps than what you're expecting and uh, the sea is coming up and you have to reassess your, your decision. Uh, Michelle and I were out sailing earlier this year and we got to that situation. At, uh, yeah, those waves are bigger than expected. Let's change direction. And then we had to cope with that for the next hour and a half or something like that. Well, it was more than that. This was a sudden calming of the waves. No wonder the disciples were amazed. Jesus said to them, where is your faith? Perhaps they weren't expecting that he could save them. Perhaps they weren't expecting that he would be able to help them to get to the other side of the lake safely. But they were amazed and in fear and asked themselves, who is this? He commands even the winds and the water and they obey him. As I said, this is a question that's in a sense been asked from the beginning of the gospel, but now it's being asked explicitly. They've seen Jesus do all these miracles. They've seen the authority that he has over sickness and, and over demons, even raising someone from the dead. Who is this man they're asking, in a sense? And now they've seen him do something which, well, you would think no human being could do. This is the sort of thing that is spoken about God doing. Especially in the Psalms, a number of times it's mentioned that it is God who stills the storms and brings them up. And on the lake, Jesus stood and spoke and rebuked the storm and it went away. Who is this man indeed? If they were wondering, could he be someone special from God before, now they're wondering even more, who is he? And that's where the question is left at the end of the first incident that we have here as Jesus and the disciples are crossing the lake. As he calms the storm, they're left asking the question, who is he? But interestingly, we get an answer in the first event that happens after that when Jesus and the disciples make it to the other side of the lake. Perhaps they were seeking to get some uh, sort of a break from the busyness of the ministry they'd been involved in in the, the northwestern side uh, of Galilee, which is much more Jewish and heavily populated area. But now they were headed to the area of Gerasa, which is on the southeastern shore of the lake, uh, much less Jewish area, uh, many people from many different nationalities, it seems. But when they got there, they encountered a man they're told, we're told, uh, who was demon-possessed. For a long time, this man had not worn clothes or lived in a house, but had lived in or among the tombs. Now, we know a few things about this man. He's an interesting character. But what we especially know is that he's possessed by demons, by these spiritual forces who are opposed to God. In this case, we know that his possession was so bad that... Uh, they had kept him 
living in madness, naked, and living among the tombs of the dead. We're also told that uh, many times it, that is the demon, had seized him, and though he was chained hand and foot and kept under guard, he had broken his chains and had been driven by the demon into solitary places. I mean, presumably the chains weren't as strong perhaps as we might expect today, but still, it's a pretty scary thing that even though he was bound, he was able to break, break out of that and to escape into these solitary places. The other thing that we know about this demon who possesses this man is his name because Jesus asked him there in verse 30, what is your name? Legion, he replied, because many demons had gone into him. And they begged Jesus repeatedly not to order them to go into the abyss. Even the demons here are afraid of Jesus. Many demons. This man has got a serious case of demon possession and it seems that no one has been able to do anything about it, but now they are afraid because Jesus has come to their part of the world. What else do the demons say? Well, when they saw Jesus, when the man saw Jesus, verse 28, he cried out and fell at his feet, shouting at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you, don't torture me. The man, the demons are afraid of Jesus because of what he can do to them, because of the authority that he has over them. Not just over perhaps an individual demon, but even in this case over many who have possessed this man. But what I think is most interesting is the demons see clearly who Jesus is. Did you notice how they addressed him? What do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? It's interesting how the people over all the time that Jesus has been doing his ministry and some of them have responded negatively, some have responded positively, but they've, they've all been asking this question in a sense, who are you? What gives you this authority? Who do you think you are forgiving sins, for example? People don't seem to know who Jesus is, but the demons, they know and they are afraid. Jesus, son of the most high God, don't torture us. Now, why would Jesus want to torture them? Because they are demonic spirits opposed to God. And he is, well, son of the most high God. And the way it's being said here, he is being addressed as God himself. He's come with the authority of God. Now, of course, there's an interesting footnote about what happens next. Jesus agrees that he's uh, not going to cast them into abyss, in a sense, but instead he sees a herd of pigs. The demons beg to let them go into the pigs, and he gives them permission, and then the, when the demons come out of the man, they go into the pigs. The herd rushes down the steep bank into the lake and is drowned. Now, of course, we, we need to remember that in uh, Jewish thinking, the, the pigs are an unclean animal that they don't eat and so that's an appropriate place for the, uh, the evil spirits to go and in the end, in a sense, they are destroyed anyway or they, they go off to do what they do when they're not possessing someone. What's interesting as well is the response of the other people in that area, verse 34, uh, the ones who were tending the pigs ran off, reported this and then the people went out to see what had happened. They went to Jesus found the man that the demons had gone out of, sitting at Jesus' feet, dressed and in his right mind. And how did the people respond? They were afraid as well. Because they had seen the power that these demons had over the man. They had seen the way that he had been just out of control. And now Jesus has completely changed that. Here's the man sitting at Jesus' feet, listening to him, no doubt. And they were afraid. Who is this man? He has power even to cast out these evil spirits. And they were afraid. Why? Jesus wasn't threatening to do anything bad to them. No, because people sometimes are afraid to come into the presence of the living God. 
the one who is the creator, the one who is the ruler over everything. People are sometimes very afraid because they know that they are sinners and they don't want to come into the presence of the living God because they know that they, they don't deserve to be in his presence. And so these people were afraid. They asked Jesus to leave them uh, because they were overcome with fear. So he, I guess, and the disciples got into the boat and left. And finally, we're told that the man was fully cured. Verse 38, the man from whom the demons had gone out begged to go with him, but Jesus sent him away, saying, return home and tell how much God has done for you. He wants the man to be an evangelist to his own people. And the man went away and told how much Jesus had done for him. Which is is good, isn't it? That he went out there and told them about Jesus and about how he had done this in God's name. But he doesn't say it exactly like that. That is, Luke doesn't say it exactly like that, does he? Jesus asked him to go and say what God had done for him. He went and said what Jesus had done for him. Now that, that might just be a slip of the tongue by the man because he'd experienced what Jesus had done and you know, how was he to understand that that was from God? And yet I don't think it's a slip of the tongue from Luke. When Luke says this, it seems to me that he is making the point. Jesus helped the man. God helped the man. Just as the demon's words were able to say what nobody else had yet been able to say. What do you want with us, son of the living God? So also the man tells the people what Jesus had done for him, what God had done for him. I don't think Luke was mistaken when he said any of that. Now it's true that son of, son of God, son of, uh, can mean Messiah or the King of Israel, but the way it's used here, I think, is intended to signify Jesus' divinity, that he was indeed God the Son. And in doing that, isn't Luke, isn't the man, aren't the demons answering the question that was raised by the disciple, posed by the disciples in the boat? Who is this man? Even the wind and the waves obey him. And the answers come through straight away. He is the son of the living God. He is God the son come to us in the flesh. Now there's still a lot more that Luke is going to unfold for us as we go through the gospel. He's going to unfold that uh, Jesus has come as the king but not as the sort of king who is going to come in right into town and conquer, kick out the enemies in a, in a violent military way. No, Jesus is the sort of king who is going to come and win salvation for his people. That's how he's going to bring people into his kingdom, is by winning forgiveness of sins. But that doesn't mean that Jesus isn't God the Son. That is something which just bubbles along through Luke's gospel. That's hinted at. And in a sense, only really becomes clear uh, after Jesus' death and resurrection. As he ascends to heaven and commissions the disciples to go out in his name. As he promises to send the Holy Spirit to be with them just as he has been with them. Jesus has shown that he really does have the authority of God as he goes about and does all this ministry. And Luke is now hinting, as he will continue to hint, that that's because Jesus is God come in the flesh. And so that then raises the question for us. How are we going to respond to Jesus, the one who calmed the storm? the one who was able to cast out these demons, the one who did all those other miracles. Now, Luke continues to present Jesus as the one that has, been, uh, that has come from God in fulfilment of all the prophecies to be the great king who will bring salvation for his people, as, as we've seen in the prophecies from Isaiah and other places. Jesus was the long-promised king and he came 
to provide freedom for the captives. He can't, he's come to provide salvation. And we've seen him start to do that, as he said to John. Tell, if you're asking the question, tell John what you've seen. The kingdom is coming in. Jesus certainly has come as the king. But in the Gospels and, and in the other writings of the New Testament, we're also reminded that this one who come as the king, who lays down his life for his sheep, is also God come in the flesh. So, for example, the, the classic statement uh, in Colossians chapter 1 by the Apostle Paul. In Colossians chapter 1, uh, verse 15, we're told that the Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. He is the one who is involved in creation and everything's been created for him. Paul describes him as the firstborn over all creation. Some people say, oh, that means he's, he's under God in some way because he's the firstborn. No, the firstborn means the one who inherits it all. But if that's not clear enough, we just have to then go back to, uh, to other places like John's Gospel. The passage that was read for us last week in John chapter 1. Do you remember how it begins? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made, and without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. And John goes on to say in verse 14, The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. That's what Luke is showing us, I think as Jesus stands up in that boat and calms the storm. You can almost hear John, you can almost see in John's mind as he's writing those verses, that, that, that verse there. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father full of grace and truth. Calming the storm, they saw his glory as he cast out those demons, as if they were nothing, they saw his glory. They saw how glorious he was and yet he went to the cross as a sheep before its it, it, uh, shearers is silent. He went in humility and suffered on that cross for our salvation and yet he is God, the Son. And so the question for us really is, how are we going to respond to Jesus? He is the creator of the world and he will be the one who judges the living and the dead one day. Of course, the good news is that we don't have to fear him the way that the, the people in Gerasa seem to fear him. Even though he is the judge, we can know that we have forgiveness of our sins through his, his sacrifice on the cross. We can know his love. That's great news. And so we can come to him as our saviour and our friend. And yet, we mustn't ever forget that he is also the judge of the world, that he is God in, in the flesh. And that's a good reminder to me. Whenever I think, oh, look, doesn't matter what I do, I can just live for myself. Whenever I'm tempted to sin, I need to be reminded that Jesus is the judge of the world. Whenever I'm tempted to be too familiar, I need to be reminded that Jesus is the son of the living God. So that I come to him in submission and seeking to live for him and not for myself. I think we need to hold those two things together. 
Jesus is the saviour who laid down his life for us, but he's also the king of the world. We need to submit to him as our Lord. Fear him as the judge. Knowing that on the day when he comes, we can have forgiveness through what he's done for us. Friends, I wonder if you pray with me that we'd have hold those two things together. Father God, we do thank you that in your mercy you showed who Jesus really was. The son of the living God. The one who came to show your glory, your grace and your truth. Father, we thank you that through him we can indeed have forgiveness of our sins, that we can come into your family, that we can know you. But Father, we pray that we might never take him for granted, that we might always remember that he is the judge of heaven and earth and that we might indeed submit to him as our Lord and our ruler. Father, help us to see your glory in Jesus as well. And we pray this in his name and for his sake. Amen.